I happen to love the book of Acts. That's where some very exciting things take place. And in today's uh, verse out of Acts 9, uh, actually what happened is Peter was in Jeddah, and he had just told Aeneas, who has a, was a paralytic for eight years, he said, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. And the story goes on to say that now in Jappa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was deemed to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Jappa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please, come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the windows stood beside him, all the widows, I'm sorry, stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Don't we live our lives because, better because of those beautiful miracles? As a woman pastor, I don't often exert my pastoral privilege from the pulpit. In fact, I rarely do. I think that's something that women in ministry find challenging. All my mentors for ministry were men, and yet I never felt comfortable with their style or approach. There was certainly nothing wrong with it. It did, after all, work for centuries. However, my approach felt more pastoral rather than dictatorial. I'm stereotyping here, clearly. There are women whose preaching style is more authoritative and men whose style of preaching is emotional and intimate. And obviously that continues to change as what we understand about gender roles and identity become more fluid. All that is to say that this morning I want to preach as a woman about women. I thought Mother's Day would be the perfect opportunity to do that. I am here in this pulpit this morning because generations of women before me lovingly served the church in more traditional roles. Some went off to seminary to be trained as pastors, only to be allowed only to serve as Christian educators or women's fellowship directors or even pastors' wives. The stole I wear, this one, which I get a lot of nice comments about because of all the pretty uh, embroidered flowers on it. Some people have asked me about that, and I thought this is exact opportunity for me to explain what I mean. So this stole was made by two women that I had in my former congregation in Delavan. Both of them were pastor's widows. And they lived at Fairhaven um, Senior Living Facility in Whitewater. And in their retirement um, there, they'd become very, very good friends. And both were excellent seamstresses. So once sewed the stole, the other embroidered the stole for a special occasion. One of the women's daughters was being ordained into ministry. She had been a teacher her whole career, and in her 50s, she decided to follow her calling to go into ministry. 
And so this was made to be presented by her mother and her mother's friend to her on the occasion of her ordination. And I love it because it is very feminine and beautiful. Those weren't my parents, my mom or her friend. So how did I come in possession of this stole? Well, not long after uh, she was ordained, this woman um, ended up uh, contracting cancer and not living long. Her name was Ruth. And uh, I attended her funeral, mourned with her mother and her mother's friend and her siblings. And about six months later, at my office at the church, a package came, just a simple brown envelope, and I opened it up, and this was in there with a note that said, from the sisters of the woman who had been given this, we were going through our sister's things, and we didn't know what to do with this. And this stole is not really appropriate for a man to wear. Their brother was a pastor also. And we thought, you knew the women who made it and that you would appreciate it. I treasure it. But one of the cool things about it is they said, if you knew our sister, you know that she was never without a cup of coffee. So she was presented this during worship and the, went to the reception following and immediately spilled coffee on it. So if you look closely, there are some coffee stains. So yeah, it's well loved. That era of woman who made this stole were the models of ministry for me. I never had any doubt about my call or ministry or the opportunities before me because brave, bold women who paved the way made that so that it wasn't a question for me. Still, my models for ministry were not in the pulpit. They were lovingly serving in ministries of hospitality and mission and education. And yet I'll tell you that even in my era of ministry where there are more women serving in, in mainline denominations like ours than there are men right now. Still, I served churches that didn't want a woman pastor. As women, we fill many roles. We are daughter, friend, colleague, spouse, parent, as well as whatever it is we do for our vocation. There are still role expectations as far as housekeeping and parenting that fall to us women. Even in an era of women CEOs, many of their books are about that struggle of the home work balance. One example from my own experience early in my ministry, and I, I hesitate to tell you this story because it reveals a lot about me that's not um, that... Uh, uh, uplifting. So <laughs> you're going to find out something about me in this story, but it's a perfect example. Uh, early in my ministry and marriage, I was serving as a full-time associate pastor, and the senior pastor was a man. And I had to have some minor surgery and was home for a couple of days recovering, and he came to visit me at our home. My husband and I both served full-time ministry positions. And as he walked into my home to visit, it was a mess. The dining room table was piled with papers. There was a basket of laundry next to me on the couch. I'd like to say that that was because I was recovering from surgery, but that's what it always looked like. We had a nice visit, and as we got up to leave, I was walking my colleague out, and he stopped at the dining room table, and he said, you must be so embarrassed. And I said, about what? <laughs> And he said, oh, no, 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 I know you're recovering, but uh, my wife would be mortified. And I said, um, what about you? And he said, well, you know, the house really reflects on the woman. I did not kill him. <laughs> and I continued to work with him. But he, I did think about what he said, and, you know, in some ways he was right. Not that it was my responsibility to maintain the house, but that women worry about those things. We have to keep all the plates spinning, even when we're also the breadwinner. I'll be honest with you. 
my vocational identity came in some way because I wasn't able to fill my personal longing to be a mother for a long time. Part of the reason that I hesitate sometimes to honor Mother's Day is not that moms aren't worth celebrating and not that I don't treasure being a mom, but because I know the pain of not being a mom and longing to be one. Having shared that part of my journey throughout the years, I heard from many other women who found this day difficult as well. They were not able to be mothers. They had difficult relationships with their own mothers or with their children, or they had lost children. Since then, I have widened the focus to include all women. And let's be honest, it took a village of women to raise you, right? When you think about all those people who are an important influence on your life and shaped who you are, I'm sure that that circle extends beyond just mother. Which brings us to Tabitha and our lesson for this morning. Now let's remember that one of the reasons that is given for women not having leadership roles in the church is that pastors fall into a line in some traditions of priestly succession, it's called, meaning that it was literally handed down from generation to generation from the first disciples, and none of them were women. So women can't serve the church. Now, aside from all of the women who are a critical part of Jesus' inner circle, this passage tells us that Tabitha is a disciple. In fact, she is the only named woman in Scripture that is specifically called disciple. She's a leader in her community who, like all of us, plays many roles. This passage of Scripture tells us that she's bicultural, she has two names. One, Tabitha, identifies her in the Aramaic and relates to her Hebrew tradition. Tabitha means beauty and grace and links her to her ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, and the prophets. And the other, her Greek name, Dorcas, represents the official language of the Roman Empire under which she lives. We don't know much about her except that she was a widow who found meaning and purpose in her life after her husband's passing, which is unusual in that time and culture when women had no role to play outside of being related to the men in their lives. We know that she is a woman devoted to good works and acts of charity. When Peter arrives at her home, all of the women gather all of the clothes that she has made for them and given to them, and they show them to Peter as a sign of what she means to them and this community. She is a woman whose discipleship is not known in preaching or teaching, but in acts of kindness and compassion. And with the words, Tabitha, get up, she is brought back to life to resume those good works. So this morning, we celebrate the Tabithas in our lives. We recognize the women who have modeled love and compassion for us. We are grateful for the maternal gift known in all who nurture and give life. We honor all those whose simple kindness is enough, as well as those who boldly risk all for the sake of justice. We pray for those who love the world's children as if they were their own, and for those whose hearts are broken by the suffering of the world. We pray for those who spin all the plates every day, keeping it all together for the sake of those they love. And we pray for peace and forgiveness when the multitasking becomes too much. 
We celebrate men who empower and support. And we honor those who step out of traditional roles to pave a way. We celebrate Tabitha, beauty and grace, the disciple in all of us, women and men. Get up. Your work is needed. Your compassion is longed for. And your gifts are celebrated. Amen. <laughs>